We can. Add that to the list, Jim. Okay. Good afternoon. This is our first uh, spring seminar. Um, I volunteered to start for primarily because I wasn't organized to get somebody else to do it. Um, and uh, this is presentation today will uh, be on some work that we've been doing, and uh, we presented it at TRB. I'm just expanded a little bit into the time we have. Um, one note is I'll be uh, finalizing the semester presentation schedules here soon, uh, and some of your advisors volunteered you, so I'll try to run down some of you today to confirm the dates. Uh, we don't have room for everybody who was volunteered, so uh, and if you didn't get volunteered uh, and you want to do it, you can see me today while I'm here so we can finalize um, a weekly seminar. Well, we plan on having it every week outside of a couple invited speakers. Okay, uh, this work uh, is uh, probably long overdue. Uh, I know some people worked on this in the past quite some time ago. Uh, and uh, I think the difference now is that we have some abilities to uh, not only calculate the effects of non-uniformity, but also to measure it. And that's kind of the difference. Uh, and we'll show some information about this. Uh, uh, the people, we've had a couple grad students working on this project from our end. Uh, Alex Brand did the initial work when he had just started grad school. And then Hamant back there is um, currently working on the project. And uh, Junior Evangelista has worked on it a little bit in terms of the 3D analysis, and he's now now gone, but still working on it, finishing up in his end of the report. This is a study that we're doing with Iowa State through the FHWA on improving the foundation layers for concrete pavements. And Professor White's the PI. He's a geotechnical uh, professor over there at Iowa State. And the objective of this project, as I am involved in it, is um, <clears throat> Professor White's looking at measurement techniques, character, uh, characterizing base, sub-base, sub-grade materials for concrete pavements, but in the end, how, how we use all this information, how it affects performance is kind of the question I'm trying to address, and uh, that's a little bit more difficult to deal with. We, we can, we're fairly good at collecting a lot of information, uh, but actually figuring out what to do with it's been the more difficult part, and uh, we've started out uh, at least looking at 2D, now 3D analysis of the data uh, and of idealized cases. The first thing we did was idealized cases. Is this really something we're going to worry about? Uh, how much effort should we put into this? And then, then, and then we've extended that to look at, well, how about if we have a combination of factors, non-uniformity of our soil plus cracks that exist in the slab from a variety of mechanisms. Uh, and then we get down to kind of the practical side of, okay, if we can use intelligent compaction, which I'll explain a bit in a second, how do we uh, define what's acceptable once we monitor? How do we know that this section is, is acceptable and this one isn't? What stiffness ranges are acceptable? And, or, or better yet, what size of areas that are non-uniform should we be concerned about? So there's a lot of questions to answer. We don't have them all answered. Uh, and the uh, project's not over, so luckily uh, we have some time to figure out some more details. Um, if you're not familiar with intelligent compaction, I'm sure that maybe they're using this in asphalt. The same technology would, I guess, would work with compactors, but uh, essentially you have your traditional compacting devices, static or dynamic drums, and uh, <coughs> they have a, uh, some type of measurement device on them that allows some kind of uh, monitoring system or feedback control. So usually it's accelerometers on dynamic compactors or vibratory compactors, and then on the static compactors you have some kind of drive motor power you can monitor. And, that, and all these are indicators of soil stiffness. None of them uh, gives you the kind of the correct soil modulus or subgrade reaction that we need to do our modeling, but they give you an in index values that are that can be correlated. Um, so there, this is not necessarily new, but the idea is, okay, we can collect this information. What are we going to do with it? And how does it affect performance? Um, and that's, that's really been the challenge of many people implementing this, uh, is, is 
going from nice pictures to uh, usable information. And so this would be a typical spatial distribution of what one of these machines would output. So if you had a, a, a lane of um, compaction, this would be your device, your compaction device, and it could monitor as, as, it, as it rolled some type of, uh, in this case, this is uh, compaction uh, meter value or uh, caterpillar compaction value, the CCV. Uh, whoops. Uh, and you can see that the different colors indicate differences in relative stiffness of, of the support condition. Okay? So clearly, uh, the dark colors are stiff areas and the lighter colors are uh, less stiff. Now, again, the question is, is how does this, does this matter? Or what are we going to do about this? Um, we know in general that in concrete pavements, it takes a large change in the K value to make much difference in the stress state in the slab. So does a large change over a small area uh, create stress concentrations? That's a question. Um, the other thing is, is somehow relating um, the, this uh, value, which again is related to the drum acceleration, to some uh, parameter we can use, let's, such as K value. Uh, so there was some, there's also additional tests going on besides just this uh, conti continuous compaction monitoring. So the first step for us to try to answer some of these questions was to uh, run some finite element analysis on idealized cases. Uh, because if we have to be able to define under idealized conditions if we can actually predict performance or an effect of non-uniformity. And we did that for a variety of conditions we would expect on a road. Axle types, curling conditions, where the axle was relative to the edge. and um, we calculate both tensile stresses, the maximum, and also deflections. Uh, some of this was presented, I think, a year ago, so I'm not going to go through it all, but a couple of them are good things to, re to go over again. Uh, and in the end here, how does our non-uniformity link to the performance uh, is, is where we're getting at. So generally, the rollers are about seven foot uh, wide, and so you can imagine making six or seven foot passes. So to make this as simple as possible initially we went with a single slab that had various non-uniformities. You can add more slabs but then you add more variables in terms of how we're going to uh, distribute the non-uniformities. We changed the subgrade modulus either to 50 or 500 which is an extreme difference uh, when you think about design. This is a very CBR 3 or 4 material to CBR 15 or 20 maybe more. You would say well we don't usually encounter that but if I don't see any difference with an extreme case, then I'm not going to see any difference with something less extreme. Um, we then looked at um, we then looked at these variations for a bunch of uh, input variables, and here's we what I'm going to show you is just a subset of everything we did, um, but we did different axle types. I'll show you tandems today, different positions because the non-uniformity changes with spatial variation of the axle and, and spatial variation on the site. So we need to move the axle because it may find a soft spot along the edge of the slab or on, along the wheel path. <coughs> and uh, we also have to recognize that loss of support, whether it's material lo loss or curling loss, could affect stresses. And then, of course, the last case here is how many different types of non-uniformity can we define? Of course, there can be a lot more than 12. We, we just did 12. I'm not going to show 12 today. I'm going to show five. So for our initial 2D runs, these are all fixed. Slab is thick eight inches. The stresses aren't going to matter so much, the magnitude, because we're only interested in the change of stress relative to our assumption of uniform support. All design guides assume that you have a uniform support. The stresses are calculated based on a uniform support. And so here's the actual types we ended up looking at. I'll only talk about tandems, and I'll show you that we're only dealing with a single slab and the stepping across of this tandem axle. And we also used the same load per wheel, and um, so we had, whether we use singles or tandems or, or steer drive, every wheel had the same contact area, same tire pressure, and same load, so that we weren't varying any other parameters. And we also did, looked at lateral offset. Obviously, this is generally the most critical case because I'm at the edge. 
or corner, um, but uh, we did look at a lateral offset near the wheel path as uh, how, how sensitive non-uniformity would be with that. And here, here again is our tandem axle. Um, we moved the axle 10 inch increments okay, across the slab. We only need to go to the middle of the slab because it's symmetric. So we, where, where the back axle here hits the middle, then, then we stop. And uh, I, think there, I think Alex cr created a little uh, simulation. This is just stepping the axle. So for all the uni non-uniform cases we ran, we, we also moved the axle 11 different spots to pick up the highest stress. So really, we're interested in the highest stress. Uh, we mentioned the curling conditions. You can imagine that depending on the non-uniformity, where it is and where the axle is, that different curling conditions would be critical or not. Uh, and again, we didn't use Illy slab, the one we used in class. If you've taken 506, we used I slab, which was basically recoded by Kazanovich over at Aris. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, user friendly if you've not used Dilly Slab, so we, we were able to get a copy of it and use it. Uh, we use very small element sizes, so mesh sizes aren't going to be a problem as we move the axle across. So here's our cases that we looked at, and we'll, I'll probably use this terminology. So if we just had a uniform soft soil under the whole slab, we call that uniform soft, very low stiffness. Note, you can imagine that our compacting device can compact one pass, two passes. So this, I think the cases we've created in general are pretty realistic except the last couple. Uh, we can have a uniform stiff soil. So either one of these can be currently designed against. Now, the question is if we distribute, distribute it differently, something like this, will this make any difference? We call this the soft edge, uh, uni non-uniform soft edges. So you can imagine that on your site you're compacting some lane and it gets stiffer than possibly another pass of the vehicle, of the compactor, right? It's possible that you would have a very wide section and you'd be doing compaction and somehow you end up with soft edges under your, uh, under your slab. And you could also end up with the reverse, right? Soft, a soft middle and hard or stiff edges. This is possible to occur. And finally, this is probably a little less possible to occur, but very interesting is if I assign randomly 50 and 500 to different spots in the slab. These are three by three panels, or three by three areas, so about a meter by meter. Uh, how would that affect the stress state as I move that tandem axle? And we actually did it for multiple random assignments, but I'm just showing two of them right now. So the interesting part is, it kind of an answers the question, if I have random spots of soft and hard for whatever reason, uh, does it actually require me to take some action? And how big do those areas have to be before I get concerned? So here's the first result. This is the easy one because you don't have any curling and, and the results become somewhat intuitive, not all, all, always intuitive, but turns out that at the transverse edge, which would be right here, okay, I start loading here and my axle goes this way, the soft edges turns out to have the highest stress and actually significantly higher in fact, it's uh, about 35% higher than just the uniform soft. So even having a stiff inner part of the slab, having soft <laughs> edges is worse than just having a completely soft and supported uh, soil. Uh, in the center here, when my axle gets to the middle here, it turns out yet that um, the, one of the random cases is actually the worst case in the middle. Uh, the other th interesting finding is that the second random case turns out to be the lowest. So that causes you concern that if I have random pockets of soft and hard, it could be bad and it could be not so bad, but I'm not really sure unless I would actually run the analysis. Um, it, we also did deflection. We calculated the deflections at each of, uh, of the axle locations. And um, as you expect, deflections are proportional more, more or less to the stiffness. So the soft soil has the highest deflections at all locations. Uh, the reason why I make it a point of this is that um, the rest of the, a lot of these are, again, the deflections aren't that big. This is one millimeter, this is two millimeters. You can measure that with a deflectometer or a geophone gauge. Uh, but, but due to the magnitude of, of the uh, 
soft subgrade, generally it would be hard to pick up non-uniformities very easily because if you have something soft, it's always going to be high. And even if you had pockets of soft and hard, you would be hard to pick them up very easily. Uh, and so it's unlikely that just deflection testing uh, randomly at one time would ever pick up non-uniformities very easily. Uh, you may be able to notice deflection changes and then maybe try to link it back, but it wouldn't be easy to do uh, due to the fact the slab is so stiff and it's more, the deflection testing gives you a more gross idea of the underlying support than a point by point. Um, our initial results for the no temperature, um, the tensile stresses are primarily high in the bottom of the stress except when you're at that transverse edge. Um, random support actually isn't good for a variety of reasons because it can produce high stresses or low stresses and you're not sure exactly. So we think around three foot by three foot areas you tend to start seeing these problems or at least spikes in the stresses. Uh, soft edges clearly are problematic that you, if you're going to design, if you're going to build something, you want to make sure if you have non-uniformities that there's no soft edges. And um, I, I haven't tried this, but I'm hi I highly doubt we'll be able to pick up very much non-uniformity by just using deflection testing only, unless you knew something beforehand. I could be wrong, but that's my guess. Now, if I have a positive gradient, daytime <coughs> gradient slab curled downward. Um, turns out that the random case, this is the random case, so as I put the axle here and move it towards the center, uh, it produces much higher stresses than everything, anything else. And uh, that kind of makes sense. Here's my soft area. The axle will be sitting about right here. So I have a soft spot here. I have positive curling, bottom stresses. So this turns out to be the worst. Interestingly, the other random case is the, is the lowest, again suggesting uh, random distributions of soft and hard is not a good idea and that should be something potentially to remediate. Um, this was the, what I just talked about. So uh, this is the highest stresses, this configuration of non-uniformity. This has the second highest and then this is the lowest. Uh, so just saying you have some kind of non-random uniformity doesn't tell you if it actually produces high stresses or not. Um, but no question, non-uniformity under positive gradients can really uh, increase the stress levels. Uh, now, if you have nighttime gradients, negative gradients, the soft edges again produces the highest stresses here. That makes sense. The corners and edges lift off. You have a gap and the stresses go much higher. Notice there's a tight uh, fit here. Uh, note the stiff edges, meaning a stiff K value and a soft middle has the lowest stresses. So at some times, it's, it makes sense to actually have a stiff edge versus a soft edge. Uh, and again, the uniform case is, is the blue here. It's not very high at all. So uniform soft isn't the most critical uh, case. And the conclusions are basically the same. So our soft edges, at least the ones we've constructed here, I'm sure I can construct other cases that may cause pr issues, are, are the worst kind of cases right now, the soft edges. And th this is just a, a summary of what I've been showing. I pick off the peak stresses on each of those plots for the different case of support cases. The point here is that uh, here's my uniform case, the blue diamond. So uniform soft is this case. We can see that non-uniformity produces in uh, four, five cases much higher stresses. So I can just, just by assuming non-uniformity under these relatively extreme uh, K value ranges, I can produce very high stress that are even worse than a very soft soil that I would assume to be my worst case traditionally. Uh, and this kind of, I like to put some numbers up there because it makes, it kind of gives you some idea of the performance uh, effect. Uh, when I have non-uniform random support, three foot by three foot areas, um, it increases uh, the tensile stress is almost 40% relative to soft subgrades. So very low strength that we would say are bad subgrades, but stiff and soft, almost 40% higher. So that, that's enough to cause a performance change by far. Uh, if I have soft edges, uh, it can increase the stresses by 34 to 60% relative to uniform. So again, depending on the curling condition, uh, all these percent increases is what I call significant. This is not a 5%, which you start getting into very little change. Uh, random non-uniformities, 
it causes us to be concerned because we're not able to predict where the, whether they're going to be critical or not. And they, may have, they produce high or low stresses. Um, and right now, again, we picked three by three because we thought, wow, you wouldn't be able to detect very good much more than a meter by meter section with an intelligent compaction device. Uh, maybe this is still too small, but uh, at least it, it shows some resolution in terms of the stress increases. So the next step was uh, to Professor White and his crew, they, they went out to the field on about seven different locations in the U.S., I think, uh, and this is just one site in Michigan where they're reconstructing I-94, and they did a variety of tests. I'm just going to show a snapshot of a test where they came in, and we didn't use intelligent compaction. Uh, at the, they did use intelligent compaction. We're not use, I'm not showing that data, but this was an intensive site where they did DCP, um, every, is it, was it 0. 0.7 meters? 0. 0.7 meters. 0. 0.6 meters. 0. 0.6 meters, excuse me. So these are all 0. 0.6 meters apart. So I can use that information to kind of correlate back to my stiffness of the soil that I can then calculate stresses. He didn't do very many of these, but enough that we could then say, well, what does the field data show us in terms of non-uniformity? So this gives an example. This is the same site, although this is an aggregate base on top of the soil. And this was our, this is the test grid. And then what we're going to do is lay a fictitious concrete slab over that and analyze it with the real data. They actually built a concrete slab on top of this. Uh, one of the problems this whole project has, not necessarily a criticism, but in, you need to have a failure to know whether what you measured and what you're calculating actually makes sense, right? Just to calculate stresses from field measurements, it'd be nice to know if there actually becomes a failure. These are all real jobs that may never produce a failure for many years, so you may not know what happens. Uh, we used a very simple equation to take the DCP data into a K value. Um, this is not the best approach, but right now we're trying to do a better job of correlating the plate load test they did with a DCP test that they did at the same site. Uh, but we use this relationship right now just to correlate DCP to CBR to K, so it's a, it's a stretch, but at least may give us a range of what to expect. <coughs> so there was 121 DCP tests, and if I we just take the DCP tests, so each one of these is a, a DCP test, each little box, and then we this is seven meters by seven meters, and then we assign a K value to each one of those, and then we analyze this with a slab on top. We can then see well what would the field data show in terms of stresses. And this comes a little bit more complicated because now you have kind of a 2D spatial distribution of K. And so where do I put the axle to produce a stress? So we did a couple different runs where we have the axle at the edge there. That's where the first one, whoops, this was the edge, the center of the slab. So if the traffic was moving this way. And finally, this would be the wheel path on the other side. And we could have done more. We're going to do more. but you have to put the axle somewhere to see how the stresses would change. And um, let's say we just took that information, we assumed for, for every 0.6 meters the K changes. That seems pretty extreme, but that's what we did. And this would be the stress distribution at the longitudinal edge. So less than 400 PSI. Um, this by itself doesn't tell us much. I have to show you some more graphs. This would be in the middle of the slab, and this would be in the left wheel path. So, okay, stresses are pretty high. This doesn't assume curling. Now, what, what we wanted to do would say, well, if we average these values, like how we usually do things, so let's just average 121 of these values. Well, now we get 63 PSI per inch, pretty soft, like our 50 PSI, and we can then compare the stresses. This is the stresses just due to a uniform. And in fact, if you look, if you saw the last two, you'll probably say, well, they don't look that different. Um, and I'll show a graph of them pasted on top of each other in a second. So what we tried to do was actually average different areas. So now we take 16 tests instead of every, or 121 tests, and we put them in blocks to see if we can get non-uniform areas that would cause a problem. Um, as you can see, the ranges here are pretty small, so they're nothing like we did in our original analysis. And we can get the stresses for that at different uh, longitudinal locations. And finally, we did 36K values. 
uh, again, the ranges aren't that great or aren't that different than uh, the mean. And finally, if we put all these together, now here's what we get. So this would be the five different uh, distributions under the slab, whether we average them all into one value or keep 121 separate values. And uh, the 121 values is the red curve here. Uh, and again, over here it produces about the maximum, but not that different than the other ones. So in this case, in this field section, this is only one case that we've run, um, it doesn't look like the range is great enough and the areas aren't big enough to actually cause major changes in the stress states. Although you can see there's some changes here, but these aren't the critical. We just took penetration rate at the, how, how deep did we go into the penetration? Yeah, you can talk that thing into the yeah. thing called edit part of our first edit, right? Yeah. How, how deep did we do the penetration rate? Uh, I think it was in the room, uh, it depends on the question that you use. So if there was a range of like four and a two, uh, 18 edits for one uh, modeling situation, and there was up to 70 uh, edits for that. But the question is, is how, how much the, the subgrade. I think we poked through the, the aggregate and the subgrade simultaneously. Yeah, so what gets you the penetration? Yeah, that's the question. What penetration rate gave us the K value? Was it the first six inches of the subgrade? Yeah, okay. the first some of the subgrade. Okay, subgrade. Well, it can be the top of the base. That can be the top of the subbase. Uh, well, uh, let's clarify when I finish up. Yeah, I think I think we pound they pounded through the subbase into the subgrade, and then the penetration rate would be based on when it hit the subgrade. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the this is just another picture of all five cases again in the middle of the lane, very tight. So really, the picture here is that at least even if you have a tight spacing, the areas of non-uniformity here aren't that big, and they're not really affecting the stress as much. Even though you have different penetration rates that are only a couple feet apart, uh, it doesn't really produce that much difference in stress states. Uh, now, if you actually look at the, the range of K values you would get from the DCP, this is what Professor Tutumler was asking, they actually range 32 to 200, which is pretty big, but the areas are so small, it doesn't really change the stress states that much in the slab. And so the idea that we probably need larger areas of non-uniformity that we'd have to detect in the field to actually produce some kind of problem, which kind of fits in with what we were saying before. Three by three seemed pretty small, but it, it had some measurable amount. Here we're talking even smaller uh, ranges. Of course, this site could be fairly uniform also. That's the other side. This was just one site in Michigan. So the last part of this study was, okay, we've got some field data. Um, and that part of the project is still ongoing. Uh, but what happens if maybe we have non-uniformities and some initial cracks in the slab? Not necessarily cracks that we would call failure, but you can see a hairline crack from something, either shrinkage, uh, thermal shrinkage initially, or if you had some initiated crack from fatigue. So we wanted to go with a 3D analysis now to look at the effects of cracks with a non-uniform subgrade support. So we looked at four of the subgrade conditions, two load locations, and two crack types. Uh, this is the work uh, Junior Evangelista was doing, and we used the generalized finite element analysis. That allowed us to have a 3D domain and run these crack problems fairly quickly. So here's our first case. So what we did is we took the results from the 2D analysis and we, we inserted cracks at the critical location, okay? So we found from the 2D analysis with a tandem that this position at the top of the slab was the highest stress case, generally for all the cases. And we inserted a, a quarter elliptical crack here, and we also in, in, entered a crack that went all the way through the slab, uh, across the slab, not, not full depth. It was, it was uh, one-third the depth of the slab. So, Anyway, this was, this was a, you know, a big crack, let's say a shrinkage crack, possibly. This one's a very small flaw. It's about a foot long. Foot long and at most a third of the depth. 
Okay, there's a close-up view. Again, this one would be H over three, this eight inch slab, okay? So it's 2.6 2 inches. And uh, this one's 2.6 here and goes into the slab 12 inches. <coughs> this one's probably more realistic. If you see a crack this large, it's probably fairly visual to see. And we then loaded with the tandem axle only at that location. We didn't step the tandem axle because it takes a long time. And these are the deflected shapes along with the stress contours. So the cracks here on the surface, this is a quarter elliptical. This is the through the length crack. And the idea here then is to calculate stress intensity factors now at these locations and make some comments about, well, now that we have cracks plus non-uniformities, what happens? So here's, here's our results. So we have four cases, uniform stiff, uniform soft, and then soft edges like I'm showing here and stiff edges, okay? And it turns out that this case, as in the stress calculations in 2D, was the worst case. So if I have a tandem axle with a through the length crack here, I end up getting K1 values. Hopefully you recognize these units, 2.0, 2 very high. Um, this is enough to crack asphalt or concrete on one load cycle. So if we have a through the length crack, and this kind of makes sense, a through the length crack, the crack's gonna be driven pretty easily. Uh, this would be soft edges. This would be a uniformly soft here. Again, the K1 is pretty high, and these are the uniformly stiff and stiff edges. So all the cases are high, the crack is long, the crack's pretty deep in the slab, makes a lot of sense. Uh, the interesting part is, is that you have a 50% jump in K1 uh, for this case. Uh, note S here is the stress intensity along the crack, crack front. So this would be, a, the S is a, a function here, is a, is a normalized uh, length essentially. So zero here is right at the edge and S of one is over here. So S, so you can use different crack length and still have a normalized uh, position. The interesting part about the findings here with the through the length crack was that um, the increase in K1 is, was at a much higher proportion than uh, when I compared uh, bottom stresses to the K1s from bottom cracks. So surface cracks with non-uniformity produced even higher K1s than if you had bottom cracks. So in this loading case with non-uniformity is even worse okay, than if I had bottom cracks and bottom stress loadings. So the, and that's, again, if you look at the deflected shapes here and the intensities, you see the area of influence, this is stresses at the top, okay? Likewise, this is stresses. The influence of a load at the top drives the crack much easier than if it was a bottom crack and non-uniformities. Uh, this would be quarter elliptical cracks, so the crack's shorter, so no surprise that the K1s come down. Uh, again, the worst case is soft edges. So soft edges drives the crack across the slab much easier. Uh, this blue line here are, is a range of published K1 values, K1C values for concrete. Doesn't mean that it's gonna unstably propagate, but uh, obviously when you get up very high values, you're likely to propagate a crack unstably. <coughs> the last case we analyzed was a uh, bottom initiated crack so you have the same quarter elliptical crack at the bottom. Here's a through the length crack, rectangular crack, tandem axles. And we did the same type of analysis. We run, we run the case, we calculate K1s. And in this case, <coughs> the most critical actually wasn't, I'm showing soft edges again, but a uniform soft turns out to be the most critical, okay, uh, for this case. So <coughs> if I have a uniform soft case, it actually turns out to be the worst case because the whole slab is soft and as the crack goes in the softer material it keeps going whereas uh, if I have a soft edges which is this curve here it eventually hits a stiff area and the K1 drops off uh, but it's still pretty high so soft edges still produce a high K1 this is about 20 percent difference here uh, so it's not insignificant so uniformly soft for bottom cracks tends to be worse than uh, this non-uniform case. Doesn't mean that a random case wouldn't be worse, but I'm just showing non-uniform soft edges against uniform <coughs> soft. Uh, this, the same conclusion can be made about the quarter elliptical crack. The K1s go down as the crack length goes down, uh, but still not negligible.
Again, if we, we generally in the lab here with the materials we have in Illinois, one is a kind of a critical K1C for concrete in, in this area. So you can see if we had top cracks, probably would have unstable propagation. Bottom cracks, well, it's hard to say whether they would propagate, but they'd be pretty close to propagating. So our 3D summary to date uh, is essentially uh, surface cracks are more affected by non-uniformity. So if we have this combination of non-uniformity and poor curing or excessive shrinkage, we're likely to get uh, a kind of a combined effect that are, that's easier to propagate cracks and have unstable propagation. Furthermore, the, as we compare bottom-up potential versus top-down potential, uh, top-down has a much higher increase to cause crack propagation than bottom-up as you, as you insert cracks. And that's kind of an and that and that's due to the fact that again, when you have transverse bottom loading, uh, the intensity is very concentrated o over one area. When you have top loading, there's a huger area affected by by the loading, uh, the stress loading. So, kind of where we're at, or what can we learn to date about this? Uh, what what to do about IC uh, intelligent compaction? That uh, I think. We, we, we're moving towards probably identifying areas that are large enough to have to do something about them under concrete because we see the stresses really peak up when there's uh, soft spots and hard spots. We probably should focus mostly on first identifying long areas that may be soft spots under concrete near the edge of the loading. Uh, the other thing that we need to do is better define of what range of stiffness values I can see with my IC device that would cause a problem and may say, well, we need to go back and make sure our variability over this site is reduced. Well, that's where I see this moving. Um, what I would like to see, uh, it makes a lot of sense to me, is actually build a section and do APT on it because we're able to monitor where, how the non-uniformities vary and then actually load and fail the section because without that, you're, you're still, we're kind of in the middle of just calculating stresses and, and making guesses. It would be nice to verify that cracks do occur at locations that we expect it to occur based on the measurements. So that part may come in an, another, another project, not on this one. Um, <coughs> one the other thing that, that uh, is important is that any time we see non, random non-uniformities, that would cause concern, that you may want to do some remediation, <coughs> whether it's uh, adding more aggregate base potentially or uh, doing line treatment, any way to reduce this non-uniformity, because that seems to be difficult to predict how a non-uniformity random case actually affects stresses. Okay, that's it. I have time for questions. I got done early. Yeah, Ernie. Okay. You talked about your intelligent compaction. This is based primarily on deflection, right, of the subgrade during compaction? Um, it, well, the devices measure acceleration of the drum. Right. Okay. But this is affected by two things. One is moisture and the other is density of the soil. Now, we have an expert here, so I'll pose this question at this time. Have you considered using ground penetrating radar to take a look at the density of the soil, because we know the moisture will eventually level out under the pavement. So the real question might be for long term, what is the uniformity of density of the soil for as far as the report? True. Just a no, that's a good question. Um, well, I don't want to predict if I can use ground penetrating radar, since uh, I may be corrected then. But my guess is you could use it, although uh, my guess is that the, the, the moisture the amount of moisture would make a big difference in whether you could pick up any resolution and density. That's my thought. Uh, but I, I think you're right. Really, you're talking about density. Uh, I didn't show the pictures, but if you watch like one pass through 15 passes, you clearly see things getting stiffer or more dense in the color changes, and clearly that's the main indicator. It's somehow connecting that drum property to something physically we can measure and, and, and know, know a physical quantity. 
Yeah, you want to agree or disagree with my comment? <laughs> Usually, Professor Alcotti would say you can use the GPR for measuring a lot of things, so. Except that's not true, but. <laughs> uh, Except voids. Anyway. Huh? Except voids. Except voids, okay. Uh, the matter of the truth is, if, if you know what's uh, the type of soil that you have there and the dry, uh, and you take uh, dry measurements for your soil, then it will be much, much easier for you to know what's the moisture content. The only problem going to be if you have some organic soil, which is not in the case of a base layer, then in that case your moisture will be uh, more attached and it will be kind of like bound. So it, in that case it will not be very well detected with, uh, with a GPR. But if it's a free water, it's very, very easy for you to quantify that. Even if uh, it's a couple percent difference? Yeah, that's uh, because the dielectric constant of the water is very, very high, so you can see that very, very quickly if you have the reference point. Uh, the question is, the is whether question your material changes enough that you can continually monitor the reference point. Uh, I, can, I can take this and compare it to the way in which we are now monitoring the density of the asphalt during the compaction. We can see the increase of the density during the compaction is very easily now and monitoring this accurately. Uh, so I think with, with this kind of compaction, uh, the same thing applied for the asphalt concrete because of the continuous changes in the asphalt in temperature makes it very hard to use it for asphalt. But I think for, for the base, uh, I myself think that this is going to be an excellent tool. Base uh, or the sub For bases and sub-bases. Oh. It will be still an excellent uh, tool because the moisture doesn't change that much during the process, but, but the, the density. But, but the later problem, on, yes. The problem is when you compact it originally, you may have non-uniform. When you, when you compact it originally, you may have non-uniform moisture and non-uniform density. Right. And uh, over time, the moisture will probably uniform out over years. Yes. So then the question is, how can I get a, a reading on the variability of my support over the life of the pavement? And what I was asking was, can you use that then to determine and predict what might be the variability of your support uh, based on the uh, uni eventual unification of the moisture and that sort of thing? Well, it's definitely a, yeah, if we, I think GPR would be, there's very few things that are going to be useful because connecting the dots between the stiffness measurement and what some other property is necessary. And uh, right now they're doing DCPs and everything manual, which takes forever. So you can't get a very good yeah. spatial distribution. You know, this, this is an excellent uh, discussion here. Actually, I'd like to make a comment, which is, a lot of the intelligent compaction devices that operate right now in one way or the other, they're trying to measure stiffness, relate stiffness from acceleration, deceleration, or uh, some kind of uh, wave theory again. Uh, uh, and, and we know that moisture is big time influencing stiffness modulus that you're trying to measure. Uh, especially right now there's an nchrp project that's going on uh, uh professor nazarian Sohel nazarian gave oh, a yeah. presentation at the committee meeting at trb and they were simply taking some soil samples at different moisture contents uh you know target you know optimum moisture contents or high or low and and making those just uh, dry out in time to see actually what changes obviously density never changes density of this compacted layer doesn't but but due to the moisture changes, the modulus is measured by light weight deflectometer or his seismic measurement technique now, uh, uh, por portable seismic payment analyzer. Uh, he's finding that the modulus is all around the place. So if we're doing only modulus-based compaction control, which we are moving into more right. and more, I mean, there, this is something that's majorly in a significant way affected by moisture and what's going to happen in time and uh, uh, how, uh, in how many hours the specification should be given uh, for the contractor to go back and forth because you know if it dries obviously it's to, to the benefit but uh, m there should be some uh, acceptance criteria on the specs I guess yeah. uh, if we're doing things on modulus based. Yeah and that's and why I think this And how much of that is actually in the long term related to the performance of that I would still go back to density that links better with strength, I think, 
than modulus from that perspective. So there's all of these issues that yeah. I, I wanted to add my Very good. <laughs> a couple cents on this. Yeah, you may have, have multiple criteria, but if you're using IC now, you're better off looking at ranges than specific values because that's what's going to change the, the stress states is the range, not necessarily a specific value. And it's a different mindset too. Cause yeah. Well, it's like using... We have LWD data from this, but you have the same problem. Right. You're measuring modulus, not density. Any more questions or comments? I know, because we're gonna. When I'm gonna sit out there, I'm gonna ask a lot more questions. Or maybe we should rethink evaluation. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you.